Welcome to this workshop on art and of science of pruning fruit trees presented by Master Gardeners of Nevada County. Here is our workshop presenter, Chrissy Freeman. Hello everyone. I'm Chrissy Freeman and welcome to the art and science of pruning fruit trees. This is part two. We did part one last week. Okay, so I've been a master gardener since 2017. And ever since I became a master gardener, I've been a member of the long standing orchard team for the master gardeners at our demo garden, which is at the Nevada Irrigation District headquarters at 1036 West Main Street in Grass Valley. If you want to know about how to prune fruit trees so that they are fruitful and look beautiful. I can recommend most highly visiting the demo orchard and looking carefully at those trees. I can take no credit for them. I just graft in the wake of the master gardener orchardists who have gone before me. They are beautiful trees and are uh, pruned uh, by people who know tremendous amounts about how to prune fruit trees and who have guided these trees through the years. They are absolutely wonderful. And before I proceed, I would like to thank Terry McConnell, who was the person who did this presentation, this workshop before me, and who is a mastered orchardist, knows more than I will ever know about pruning fruit trees, and who one day after this workshop hacked me into uh, succeeding her in presenting this workshop. She has been a wonderful guiding light for me. Thank you, Terry. So what are we gonna cover today? First, we're gonna talk about basic pruning techniques. We'll do this review uh, for people who may not have been at the session last week to make sure that everyone understands pruning techniques that are needed in order to uh, take care of trees uh, in various circumstances. Then we'll head into the various uh, topics that we're gonna cover today. The first is planting, at planting time, how do we prune our little baby trees? Next, we'll talk about how do we prune young trees so that they grow up the way we want them to. The third is what if we have big overgrown trees you know, those trees that you move into a place and it's just huge, or a tree that somehow gets away from you before you learned how to prune trees so that they stay the size you want them to. And finally, we'll talk about what is the role of pruning in working with infested and diseased trees. So in order to prune fruit trees, right, we need to know what the various parts of the fruit tree are. Okay, first, here's the terminal bud. The terminal bud is the bud at the end of each branch or shoot. That's where the energy of the, tr of the tree is. And we leave that there when we want the tree to keep growing in that direction. And we move and we cut that off when we want the tree to not grow in that direction anymore. Over here, anything that grows out of a big branch and grows off to a side, we call that a shoot. It's important to be able to differentiate a leaf bud, which grows close to the shoot or the branch from a fruit bud, which grows out from the branch and even more so than the spur, which grows uh, on an apple or a pear grows like a teeny tiny little stub. And then there are several little fruit buds that will grow out from it. One last piece before we continue. See here, these little lines at the place near where the shoot emerges from the branch. That's called the branch collar. It's very important to note that if you're planning on 
uh, pruning off this shoot, as we'll talk about later, you want to be able to, you want to cut above that branch collar, kind of parallel with those lines at a 45 degree angle. We'll talk about that. You want to leave that branch collar on. So there are two kinds of pruning cuts. The first of which is called the thinning cut. You look over there uh, at that photo, you'll see that this master gardener is completely cutting off that shoot all the way down to the branch collar. When you do a thinning cut, you are reducing the number of new shoots on a branch. And what happens as a result of that? You get more light inside the tree, naturally. And also the growth of the tree, the energy of the tree is directed at the remaining branches. This is very important. And uh, the thinning cut is something you'll do again and again on your trees. How do we do a thinning cut? Okay, you remove the entire shoot or the branch at the trunk or at the lateral branch, yeah, all the way to the end, leaving that branch collar. And you angle that cut just at a slight outward angle. You see that? So it's a little narrower at the top, a little broader at the, at the, at the bottom. Okay, leave that branch collar. Okay, wow, look at all those vertical branches. Here's an opportunity for some thinning cuts. Because if you left all those vertical branches, you would not have enough light coming down into that tree. Okay, so you want to thin those vertical branches, use thinning cuts on the vertical branches. But don't use thinning cuts on those horizontal branches because if you do that, you're going to remove fruit. So be very careful about where you use thinning cuts. Okay. Now, what if you have a big limb or a heavy branch that you need to thin? What happens? Okay, maybe it, you know, it's not producing fruit anymore, or maybe there's a damage or disease on it that means you need to take it out. If you do that, don't just start cutting from the top down, as you'd see in this picture, because you can see, oh my gosh, there's breakage, which we don't want. So how do you thin this? The first thing you do, step one, is to make an undercut. So you see this undercut here? Okay, cut up. You might use a pruning saw to do this, okay? When you do this and you see how you're a distance away, you're not cutting at the branch collar, but maybe a foot away, okay? This undercut will stop the bark from tearing. This is really good because you want to avoid that. Then you make a second cut from the top all the way through the branch and it'll, it'll, you'll meet up with that first cut, okay? You start a little bit further away from that first cut and it'll go all the way through. Then the final cut, once you've removed that, the long piece, which happened when you took off that second cut, okay? Then you're gonna make a nice smooth cut just beyond that branch collar. Hold on to that stub so that no bark gets broken, okay? No bark gets torn and you've removed that large limb and you have a nice smooth edge. I'll admit, sometimes your, your edges are not gonna be perfect, but you know what you wanna strive for and now you have a method for doing a pretty good job. So here's a, some wonderful before and after on thinning. On the left is a several year old peach tree before and after. You can see how much more light comes through the tree after it's been thinned. And this is what you want so that the light will help the branches get uh, stronger and will also allow the, the fruit to form and the fruit to ripen well. The second kind of cut that we do is called a heading cut. In a heading cut, you take off the terminal bud, but you do not cut the whole branch away. You take off the terminal bud, and that means that branch does not grow anymore in that direction. When you cut off that terminal bud, the growth that had been going towards the terminal bud, that energy now goes 
towards new shoots that will come out of little teeny vegetative buds, like a little bud here, this will get more energy, this will get more energy, everything here, it becomes bushier. And also all the remaining branches become stronger. So when you need something to become stronger, if it's thin, this, a heading cut is the way to go. So how do you do the heading cut? You cut off that terminal bud, you use a 45 to 60 degree angle, so don't cut it straight across. You see her cutting right above a bud, okay, within a quarter inch of a bud, and cut again at that slight downward angle, okay? That way then water doesn't pool. If you cut at a straight 90 degree angle here, water's gonna pool there, increasing the chances for disease. That holds for every cut you make, always at an angle. So, Here's kind of a Goldilocks situation. How do you place the heading cut directly relative to a bud? Here's what you want, Goldilocks. You want it, ah, huh, you know, slight angle, just a little bit above a bud or a leaf node. Okay, here it's too high and that big stub could die back. The next over, it's close to the bud. And ooh, if it's too close to the bud like that, the bud might die and then you wind up with a long, a long stub again. Here on the far right, the angle of cut is too slanted and that exposes too much of the inner surface of the branch to the outer atmosphere and therefore to disease or insects. So heading before or after. I don't have photographs. Maybe someday I'll have them, but for now we'll have these wonderful little illustrations. And you can see you're bringing down the size of the tree, but when you cut the branches back part of the way, what you're going to wind up with is each of these branches, because you haven't removed them, but you've cut them back to a bud, they're going to puff, they're going to, they're going to spread out and you're going to get a fuller tree a shorter but fuller tree. So let's do a quick comparison of the results of heading versus thinning. Okay, so heading in the, okay, you've headed it back, you cut it just to a bud. You didn't take it all the way back, you cut it to a bud. So what happens? You get bushiness, okay? You cut it back to a vegetative bud, you're gonna get more vegetation, more vegetation, more vegetation, more vegetation, okay? Lots more vegetation. In a thinning cut, you cut it all the way back to the next ha 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 thin branch. Okay, what happens? This branch grows a lot. See how much taller it is? This branch, this little piece of vegetative growth here, it's, it's, it's more of a branch, okay? So it's mostly that this grows taller and it's more open here, much more open. So now that we understand about thinning cuts and heading cuts, we can now proceed to talk about the circumstances of various um, aspects of pruning for different plant conditions. The first one we'll talk about is pruning when we plant our little baby trees. This is gonna come up in January for people who are considering getting little planting little trees. Now, by the way, is the time to order your trees. So why do we prune at planting time? We prune to balance out how much roots a plant has with how much top volume it has. Those roots, no matter how careful we are, they do get ah, damaged, traumatized, it's tough life being a bare root. So we want to reduce the top volume so that the roots are not overstressed. They don't have to support too much volume when we first plant the tree. Also, pardon me, also we want to make sure that the tree branches start branching low enough that we're taking advantage of how tall we are relative to when the tree, where the tree is when it starts producing fruit. We don't want the first fruit to be too high for us. So what do we do? We cut the tree to 24 to 36 inches high. And any side shoots that are in that 
24 to 36 inches high range, if there are side shoots there, we cut them down to just two buds, okay? And one non pruning thing that I'll be sure, that I really wanna make sure to emphasize is that you uh, give sunburn protection to your trees. You mix up half, a, a mixture that's half white latex interior paint and half water and just use a brush and brush that on the trunk of your trees um, all the way down to soil level. And this is great sunburn protection. The little trees need it. And then repeat this about every year or two as needed. It's very important. Um, as the trees get older, you'll do this on the side branches as well. And you'll do this on a repeat basis throughout the life of the tree. So here's what it looks like at planting. And you're like, wait a minute, is that a stick afterwards? And the answer is, yeah, sometimes it's just a stick because sometimes there are no side branches. But there might be little buds, you know, just little buds and those little buds, they're gonna grow up to be side branches in the spring, not to worry, okay? There must be some buds below where you cut. And when you cut, be sure that you cut um, below, just above some bud. So uh, that's one of the things that determines, well, am I cutting at 24 inches? Am I cutting at 36 inches? Look for where there are a couple, make sure that there are a couple of vegetative buds below the cut so that you will have places where branches can start. So here are kind of the way that the years go. In that first year, uh, once the shoots begin to grow out from that whip, um, then if there are off those, off those side branches, if there are any little shoots that sprout off um, to the side or sprout off downward, um, prune those off, retain only the shoot that's growing. If there are shoots that are growing more upward, keep those and keep the, of course, the main shoot that's growing outward. So keep those. And then as the first year progresses, you're gonna have that central leader itself, the main one that's coming off, prune off any side branches or any lower branches to keep the energy flowing up that main shoot. So it's, it's, it's a very specific kind of pruning that you do when the tree is very young. And I would say, don't expect to memorize all this and have this all down, everything you should know about young tree training and different methods of training young trees. Um, just from this one presentation, uh, there is a handout for this class, for this workshop, that is in the same place where you got the Zoom information for this program, for this workshop. And there are several books listed there. Um, I would recommend getting and using one or more of those as your guide. Uh, because you'll look at those pictures again and again, uh, maybe even between every cut and several times a year, you know, in the winter, in the spring, in the summer, uh, look at those pictures again to help guide you. Uh, it's the way that people uh, do it, particularly when they're working with young trees. Um, and then, pardon me, then in the second year, um, you'll see that the scaffold branches have, have grown significantly. If there are any very low scaffold branches, um, like you know, lower than 18 inches, cut those off. The higher scaffold branches, cut those back uh, by you know, about 20% or so. Um, and that will uh, head those, you know, head those, and that will encourage the plant to become uh, more bushy, get, get more side branching, which is what you're gonna want. Because then in that third year, uh, you'll see that you're going to have some side scaffolding on those side branches. How wonderful is that? Okay, then you're going to trim back that side scaffolding and you're going to have some new scaffolding as well as the tree grows taller. This is great. Look at that. It's really beginning to look like a tree. Okay, this is the point at which 
your tree after that third year is gonna be ready to bear fruit. Okay, so why does it make a difference? Let's look at this. If you do, the, if you do it correctly, then each branch is on a, of the main scaffolds is on a different side of the tree. So there's lots of light that comes into the tree and each branch is branching out and out and out. So there, and the branches are getting um, thicker and thicker. So they're getting stronger, but, oh, sorry. But if you don't create a proper scaffold, then over time, the tree is just going to have a, an inbred weakness where multiple scaffolding branches come together at the same place and the tree will be um, very dense in the center and it will be hard for light to come into the center and therefore it will not bear fruit as well, as well as having a weakness. So, in order to train a tree well when it's young and as it's growing in those first several years, you want to know what you're aiming for. And there are, these are the three main ways that fruit trees are trained and different species tend to use different specific systems. Uh, the central leader on the far left, um, tends to be used only for specific situations. People who want apple trees that are gonna grow tall, um, occasionally for dwarf varieties, you could use it. Um, we master gardeners um, uh, tend to use um, other systems, the modified central leader or the open center even for apple trees because we tend to like um, trees that are trained to be smaller so that all the fruit can be picked without having to go onto ladders. And uh, I have done this and it is demonstrated in the, mass, in the Master Gardener demo orchard and it is a beautiful solution for home orchards. It's really terrific. So uh, there are other uh, options too, uh, such as Pardon me. Uh, there are other options too. There's bush, uh, fruit bush, espalier, uh, Y system, but uh, those are less frequently used. And also I've never done them and I don't have any pictures of them. So we're just gonna stick with these. And um, those others are mentioned in the Chuck Ingalls book, which is referenced in the uh, handout if you're interested in them. We're gonna talk about central leader first, uh, because it is the basis also for the modified central leader, uh, which uh, more is also used more frequently. So here's the basic description of the central leader. It's a single dominant trunk, and boy, do you see that single dominant trunk here? And there are tiers of lateral, you know, branches that go out from the side, uh, distributed all the way around the trunk. So as I said, mostly used on apples and occasionally by pears. Um, and yep, they do look like Christmas trees. And the reason that the sunlight reaches the, the bottom wood is because it's shaped like a Christmas tree because those lower laterals are broader than the upper laterals. I've heard that the central leader gives the best color development for red fruit. So if you are doing red apples, um, you might look into that a little bit uh, if you are willing to have a taller tree. Um, so if you're thinking, okay, I'll do a central leader. How do you prune your tree at planting time? You cut that whip to the height that we talked about. And the idea is to have a bunch of buds below the cut. If not, then adjust that cut to be a little bit higher. Okay, okay. If you have a bunch of branches that come out from that, then select three or four of those branches as scaffolds all the way around the trunk. 
and this might happen at planting time. You might need to wait until it happen until you get those branches later in the spring, and you'll do that then. Um, when they get really long, cut them back to a third or half of their length. Okay, that helps them branch out. As we've talked about, these are heading cuts. Okay, so you'll see here in the first spring, um, you've cut back the central leader. We talked about that. You, you cut back the, 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 the tree, and now you're getting this new central leader growth here. Okay, and then these, if you have some shoot that's going to compete with the central leader, you cut that back, you cut that off. And then you're looking here, see at branches that are going to be useful as permanent branches. Over here on the right, okay, it's very interesting. Um, this is something that you can do for any method. Um, if you want those, those first scaffold branches to be 45 to 60 degrees um, off of upright. But if they are too vertical, then uh, when they get to be about two feet long, uh, you're gonna want to um, create some kind of method for, um, for pinning them back. And you can use something like clothespins very nicely to do this. Um, and you can also use other pieces of wood. You can use, uh, you can, pardon me, you can tie weights on the end of the branches. Um, but if you leave that there for a season or so, the wood will have uh, become strong enough and grow in that direction that you can remove whatever you were using. Okay. So then how do you continue your pruning if you're gonna do a central leader? Or same will go for a modified central leader. So just pay attention here if you're thinking, oh, well, I don't think I wanna do a central leader, but a modified central leader, that, that could apply to uh, many, many uh, varieties of trees. Okay, so what you do is you're gonna create a whorl. So like a, 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 if you look from the top of the tree and you look down, you're gonna go, a lateral, and then you go a quarter of the way around the tree, or there's another lateral, but maybe, you know, six or 12 inches higher, and then another one, and uh, it's another 90 degrees around, and another one that's maybe, you know, another 90 degrees around, or maybe there are three by the time you go all the way around, okay? That's one level of the tree, okay? Then at the end of the, that first season, or early in the second season, you're gonna identify what is the next level of three or four lateral branches, okay? What I find useful is to take some kind of plastic tape or something like that, mark those branches so I make sure not to cut them off and then prune off the branches that I don't want. Then as you're heading those branches back, make sure that the upper branches are do not extend as far outward as the lower branches. Remember, you're trying to create a Christmas tree shape. That allows sunlight to reach the lower branches. So we got this modified leader idea. Okay, why do we create, why might we use a modified central leader? Yeah, first of all, it makes it much easier to keep the tree shorter and with Trees like apples and pears, particularly apples, boy, can they get tall. So this is an easy way to keep that apple and that pear shorter. Okay, particularly the apple. It makes the tree have a rounded shape. Notice how this does not look like a Christmas tree. Well, if you don't want a Christmas tree, here's an option for you. Okay, it's often used on pears, persimmons, figs, pomegranates. You can use this on lots of kinds of trees. Okay, so how do you do it? Okay, many of these steps sound familiar since we've already talked about the central leader. Okay, first you, you start out just like the central leader. You create that central leader, you create a couple layers of whorls. Once those whorls are established, you cut the central leader. See how there's no central leader here? 
okay? But I didn't cut it right away. I waited, one waited here until these whorls were established so that the energy of the tree was upward, okay? And then once so several layers of whorls were established, okay? Then we cut that off. But still, the, the upper branches are narrower than the lower branches so that light comes through. That central leader will probably be becoming less dominant and, and high enough anyway. So you can cut it off and don't worry about it. It won't harm the tree. Okay, now let's talk about the open centered uh, structure, also sometimes called the vase structure. Um, this is used um, throughout the demo garden. Uh, so you can go there and you can really see what this looks like. And I, um, this can be used on, on any fruit tree that you have. It can also be used for nut trees. Um, the wonderful thing about this is that it's very easy for this to allow sunlight into the tree, which helps branches be stronger and it helps more fruit, um, uh, uh, it helps more blossoms turn into fruit and the fruit um, uh, ripen nicer. What are the disadvantages? First of all, look at this. It's a, it is a wider tree. And I can tell you that from experience. I get wider trees. My apple trees are wider. My peach tree is wider. They're just wider. My fig tree is wider. Yeah, wider trees. Okay. Um, you get more shading because there's more growth on the top. It's harder to have light come through the tree uh, right here and right here. I fight this all the time. Um, and also, you're trying to have the tree be not so tall, but the tree wants to grow. So you're every summer you're having to do significant summer pruning to keep the height down. And even in winter, I find, oh my goodness, there's, I need to, I need to keep taking um, branches off the top. So that's just the cost of doing business with the open center. So how do we create an open center? Okay, the first year uh, after the tree has leafed out, you just as you would do with the, uh, central leader and modified central leader, you find those three or four shoots that are gonna become the main structural branches arrayed evenly around the trunk. Okay, then you, you choose those. Remember, you know, you're gonna mark those with plastic tape or something. You pinch back all the other shoots to four to six inches. Just, you know, pinch them back with your fingers, kind of back if you need to. It's kind of a form of heading, okay? Then in early June, you go back to the tree again, and then you take those, those three or four suits that you've selected, okay? And then you head them back, okay? To two, by two to three feet, you know, you take them, you shorten them a couple of feet. What does that do? That promotes side branching of those branches. You're trying to, mm, 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 you know, keep this tree contained because it doesn't want to be contained, okay? And then look for branches you don't want, you know, and downward branches, um, branches that are crossing any branches, you know, keep, keep those branches only that you want. Remember that the lateral, lateral branches, these are the ones where the fruit can grow. These are also, look at ones that might provide shade for fruit below, um, shade for the trunk. Um, the trunk um, is gonna burn really easily when it's young. Um, and um, having some natural shade from leaves is a nice little thing. On the second year, okay, you're gonna have, you have these, these primary st structural branches, a select a, one or two limbs on each primary, head them back to half their length and take off everything else on those limbs. So now you're getting a nice, good basic structure, a good lateral, a, a, you know, a, a good, primary limb and a couple of laterals, a good primary limb and a couple of laterals. You simplify the tree, everything else comes off. This is pruning. Okay. And then 
the thing is, you're going to be, this is a wonderful example of a modified central leader tree. See, you, you can really see the scaffolding. Um, you can really see that it's had its central leader cut off. Um, and you can really see that it's pretty simple. Um, you prune these young trees pretty heavily in the first three years because you want them to grow strong in those first three years and you don't expect any fruit. Okay, so I think that takes care of our question of what we do with the young trees and turning them into a good structure. So now we're gonna talk about what happens if you can't, if you move to someplace and you've got giant trees. And this is an example of a giant tree that my neighbor inherited when uh, she and her husband moved to uh, a place nearby. Uh, you know, or maybe you, you didn't know that much about pruning and trees just grew to be so high that you can't reach the fruit to harvest it. Oh my goodness, that does mean that the tree is overgrown. And, you know, let's talk about this. Do you want to save your tree? Let's ask the question. Do you like its fruit? Does it have serious disease or insect problems everywhere? Are there some improved varieties, things, you know, varieties that you would like better, that would be easier to grow? Would you like a different kind of fruit tree? Okay. You know, because the pruning that's going to be required will be considerable to bring this tree back to the right size and shape. And that's going to take place over the course of several years. You know, first decide whether you want the tree. And you very well may decide, yes, you do. Or you could decide, no, I don't. So make that decision. OK, so let's think about how we go about pruning an overgrown tree. This tree doesn't look so overgrown in this picture, but this is a very overgrown uh, pear tree. It's way too tall. And as you can see, not in any kind of shape at all. So let's think about how best to attack this or, okay. So first of all, try to figure out if there are a few large pruning cuts that you could accomplish uh, that would carry your, your pruning project forward. Um, and the other thing to know is that you want to prune with the idea in mind that it's gonna take you three to four years to prune this tree down to the size you want. Um, and that doesn't mean that you prune the left side one year, then the middle and then the right side. It means you prune part of all the tree down, it means you prune the tree down part of the way. Um, you take your time, but all the way along, the tree looks good. So remember that if you do too much pruning at once, uh, remember the heading cuts and that the heading cuts spur growth. Remember the, the um, the thinning cuts and that the thinning cuts put more energy into, into other parts of the tree. So we can only prune so much in one year. That's why we wanna, that's one of the reasons that we wanna spread this pruning out over the course of three or four years. My trees, uh, when I met the master gardeners, my goal with my trees had been that I could uh, pick all the fruit while standing on a ladder. Once I met the master gardeners, my goal became to pick the fruit while standing on the ground. So my trees were not that much too tall, but it still took me four years to get my trees down to the size where I could prune them while standing on, I could, pardon me, that I could harvest all the fruit while standing on the ground. And it is a marvelous thing. Um, and it's a great way to learn about, um, about pruning. I highly recommend it. Um, it's it's kind of low stakes uh, in that regard. Um, don't prune, pardon me, don't fertilize your trees while you're doing this and don't, don't, don't fertilize it after you do it because what does fertilizing do? It prompts a 
plant to grow. And we do not want to prompt these overgrown trees to grow. So one way to do this is to make mostly thinning cuts. So you remove the dead diseased crossing limbs and you thin the canopy for light, but not enough that you're gonna burn things. You know, you know, so you completely remove certain branches, okay? And remove any brand, remove branches that you where you can't reach the the fruit, okay? And you can prune it to the same height um, every year. Um, and then when it gets new vigorous shoots, get those out every year, okay? And then over time, you can. Um, Prune some of those, prune some of those down and lower the, the height of the tree. There's another method, and this is one that I recommend if you want to be able to reach more of the fruit, is to reduce the tree height slowly over three to four years. So you reduce the excess height by about a third every year in the winter during dormant pruning until you get to the height you reach. And what happens is that you reduce it by a third and it'll grow back up and it'll even though you reduce it by a third, it'll still take you four years, but it's gonna be great. I promise you, you're gonna love it. So when possible, you cut back to a lateral branch. It's at least a third the size of the main branch. So, you know, cut back all the way to, to a branch. Don't cut back just to a bud. It's, it becomes a matter of a thinning cut again, okay? Remove or had any suckers on water sprouts once or twice during the summer. So really be on the lookout for these water sprouts because um, they're not helping your tree and they're gonna grow really vertical, really fast. And make sure to do summer pruning because summer pruning is where a lot of the uh, uh, excess height comes and uh, where a lot of the new growth comes. So if you have overgrown trees, uh, be sure to remove new growth in the summer and height. So if your trees uh, show some kind of a problem and you're like, is this a disease? Is this a pest? What is it? Should I prune this thing away? We've all had that inclination. Maybe if I just clip it and put it in the green waste, that's the best solution. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. The first thing to do is to figure out what the problem really is. Because some conditions you can solve without pruning. So you're not going to lose the leaves. You're not going to lose those fruit buds. Okay, so figure out what it is. And if you can't figure it out by going to our wonderful um, UC Agricultural and Natural Resources integrated pest management website. Um, maybe our moderator can put the URL for that integrated pest management website um, in the chat. There's nothing better for helping to figure out what a problem is than looking at the pictures and the descriptions in the IPM website. Um, so some conditions don't require pruning. Um, underwatering and overwatering would look approximately the same. Uh, and it's common with fruit trees. People mean well, but ha haven't quite figured this out. Aphids, you know, let's not prune the aphids out. We can, I, you can fix aphids uh, with uh, water sprays and other solutions. Coddling moths, um, often a problem in pears and apples. Um, yeah, let's not solve that problem with, um, with, with pruning, uh, we can use coddling moth traps for that. Many other problems like that, okay? Um, if you don't know what it is, um, you can take a photo of the, sim of the symptom. And uh, if you're not sure what it is, you can email it and send the photos to uh, Master Gardeners by using the form that's at, Nevada County, at the Nevada County Master Gardeners website uh, under, uh, need help and uh, from our website and people will help you. Um, then some conditions do require pruning. These are the ones to know about. 
for our purposes. Fall webworms, tent caterpillars, they kind of look, they look like what we've got here. I thought uh, this was an old picture that I had and I thought, oh, this is tent caterpillars like as we had in the demo garden earlier this year, but I was corrected um, by Terry who said, no, these are fall webworms. And uh, so you can see it's mostly a time of year thing that determines which one you have, uh, but there are some other differentiations. In either case, this is something that one does cut out. And also the unfortunate fire blight, which we'll have a picture of and talk about a little bit more, which affects uh, apples and pears. Now, if you do have to prune some infestation or disease, okay, the specifics of exactly how you do it um, do depend on the issue, but the important thing to know is that all of that material goes in green waste. Um, if you don't have green waste, then put it in your trash. Uh, or yes, you could burn it if it's during uh, burn periods, pardon me. Um, and between each cut, clean your pruners or whatever tool you're using with rubbing alcohol. This is the spray bottle of alcohol that I use, or you could use um, a solution that is one part bleach to nine parts water. I find rubbing alcohol works a lot better. It's just easier to use. And uh, fire blight, this you definitely have to cut out. Um, this is not a class on diseases, but let's just, let's just say, if you start seeing anything on your apples and pears that are blackened like this, you definitely, or, or, or really withered and the branch chip turns down looking like a crook, that's fire blight. Um, and um, it appears generally in the spring first. And then um, you just, there are very specific, there's very specific information on how to prune this out. You have to prune it out um, down at least 12 inches to the next place, uh, to the next intersection of a branch. Uh, it, you prune out a lot more than you want to of your tree, but the results are um, that you can keep this from infecting more and more of your tree. Um, I have fought this um, and, um, and had it not be a problem again, in future years, but I've had to prune out uh, quite a bit of a tree over the course of uh, spring and summer. Um, but just keep at it um, and uh, be willing to cut up more of your tree than you would like to and, and do a very, very clean job. Um, it's all a matter of um, being, uh, you know, if the, it, it grows when the bees are out and it's warm and wet. So um, here is an example of fire blight. See this dark, this dark branch here and the dead leaves, but it's the dark black here that's kind of the giveaway. That's why it's called fire blight. If you make your cuts uh, without cutting out enough, the fire blight will keep spreading and that could lead to the death of the tree. It can also appear on um, non, fruit trees, so be careful. So there we are. Uh, this is an example. These are some of the main resources that are uh, listed, um, I say, uh, on the resources list that's on the website. Uh, so please um, be sure to download the handout because as you prune your fruit trees, you're going to want to have I, if you're at all like me, you're gonna to wanna to have some pictures available. You're gonna to wanna to have some guidelines available uh, for looking at as you go. And I have found um, any of these, uh, the Sanford Martin book, the Chuck Ingalls book, and of course our wonderful new Western Sierra Foothills Garden Guide uh, and chap in, in the chapter on fruit trees on pages 141 to 160. Any of those are absolutely fabulous. And the California Backyard Orchard by UC Davis, they are absolutely terrific. Oh my goodness, I misspelled. Uh, under it, the un integrated pest management is ipm.ucdavis.edu. 
So now it's time for questions. And I look forward to hearing from you. Take it away, Sylvia. When you prune a young tree after you plant it, do you really prune off everything so it looks like a stick that feels really extreme? You know, it sure has felt that way to me when faced with doing it. But, but now my trees are mature and producing just fine. So to, to increase your trust in this process, remember two things. One, you're doing this pruning so the tree's above ground structure doesn't overtax its existing root structure. So it's okay. And when you do this heading cut, you're encouraging the dormant vegetative buds, which are below that cut, to develop new shoots. So make sure you do that cut, leaving several vegetative buds below that cut. Okay, thank you. Here's your next question. We moved to a place that has a really big apple tree. Its lowest branches are about four feet off the ground. Is it worth trying to make this tree shorter? <sighs> well, if most of the tree's fruit is, is out of reach or out of reach unless you do ladder work, you'd rather avoid, um, but you like the apple and you like the role of the tree on your property, then I'd lean towards keeping it. Uh, keep in mind that bringing the height down will take some work and some patience, you know, more pruning than you'll have to do later. So hang in there, you know, it's, it's three or four years of more pruning than you're gonna to wanna to do. And then the tree will be just a regular apple tree. Um, if, if that's not your style, however, or you don't wanna do that much pruning of a tall tree for multiple years, um, then you could consider replacing that tree with a new, with a new one. I mean, it, it, in the end, is up to you. Great. Um, one last question. Mm -hmm. We're getting some new fruit trees. What's a good resource for seeing pictures of the, the diagrams that you showed us on ways to prune young trees? I always, I always recommend looking at, I mean, now, I had my trees in for 14 years and I still take out the, I still take out the Sanford Martin book because it's really small. It's really easy to carry around in the garden. I take it out every time I prune my trees. Um, but I really highly recommend the new 2020 edition of the Western Sierra Foothills Garden Guide by our master gardeners of Western of Nevada County. And I don't say that just because it's our book. I promise you that. Um, first of all, um, the diagrams are really good and the explanations are really good. Uh, but also um, uh, it's, it's got the spiral binding. And so it's really easy to, to lay it flat when you're working. So you can put it on your garden cart or you know some other place in your garden. And then it's really easy to look at it and, and it stays open to the page you want. So it's really a winner for working in the garden with it and the orchard. Great, thank you. That's all the questions we have. And I'll just say, I always enjoy your presentations. Part one of this workshop was really interesting. And part two brought the same basic information forward and then elaborated on it. So thank you for a terrific presentation. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm really glad that people showed up and I love doing it. Thank you. Enjoy your trees. <laughs>